So feeling a lot of gratitude come up tonight. It's rare you get your own mom requesting the Dhamma talk. And uh, then also get to request to speak from a teacher that I have such uh, respect and gratitude for is Long Porpasano. And um, just for this lineage and teaching up in uh, Seattle, where I am most of the time these days, I don't have kind of not surrounded by this community of fellow monastics and the structure of the lineage. And just to see these eight precepts given as they've been given for 2,500 years. And uh, I wonder if for all 2,500, everyone stumbled through that Nacha Gita one. It's, it's always impressive when you make it through the whole, the whole way. But it uh, does remind me of a story from uh, Long Porpasna's biography, actually. And I wonder if I'm going to get this wrong. But uh, basically, in Bon Pei, where what Mop John is, where I ordained, uh, there was a disciple of Long Por Cha who set up a monastery. And after his first round in Kanchanaburi going Tudong, Long Por Pasano visited there. And Long Por Cha was visiting the branch at the time. And he learned about this story where Bon Pei, the fishing village, is a uh, was a village which was ruled by or at least inwoven in terms of the power dynamics with a sort of underground mafia. And one of the mafia leaders came to the abbot of this new monastery at some point and was expressing a lot of regret over his actions, which may not have been completely pure. And the abbot, to his credit, sent him off to visit Long Por Cha in Wat Bapong. And Long Por Cha had this mafia head uh, sit sleep under his kuti. It's not as bad as it sounds. They're on stilts and there's a sort of patio underneath for about a week and carry his yam, his little bag, and just be his assistant for a whole week. And by the end of it, the mafia boss was just completely changed and returned to Bon Pei and called his gang together and informed them all that they would all be keeping the five precepts from then on. And I don't know how that meeting went completely, but uh, he meant it. And he knew that it would be impossible for him to maintain his grip on power and to run an underground business in that way, keeping the five precepts. So he spent the next year and a half of his life putting his affairs in order, making sure that those he cared for and who depended on him were provided for. And at the after about a year and a half, he was murdered. But the end of his life was kept with this sense of purity, of redemption, and these precepts and this structure, this lineage, this crystalline, pristine teaching we've been given. I don't know if we always understand its power or value, the potency of what this thin, quiet thread has done through history, through the rise and fall of civilizations. I don't know what we what the world would look like without the Arahants, which have quietly lived in, in our midst. I was at a monastery about a, two weeks ago, and one lay supporter of the monastery was talking about his first encounter with Longpur Biak, who was visiting the monastery, a very well-known monk in Thailand. And apparently Longpur Biak was very interested in this layman's... Uh, he makes maple syrup, so Longpur Biak asked to go visit and see how he did it. And the next night, this layman had this one of the most vivid dreams of his life where he dreamed he was a young boy playing in a stream so and laughing so hard that his belly hurt. And he was with his brother in the stream in a tropical location. And he said he woke up and knew just deep in his bones that that was him and that the other boy... Uh, he thought was Long Por Biak and this vision from this previous life, if you believe in such things. And I thought it was such a beautiful testament to the goodness hiding right below the surface of these clothes of a temporary life and a current existence we put on. The fact that this sort of normal-looking layman just supporting the monastery 
the fact that he had this karma where there's, you know, a good chance if you believe in such things that he had been the brother of Longpor Biak in a previous life. And just the amount of brightness hiding in our midst, I think we can forget. So to come back into an environment like a Bayagiri, which is rippled out in such powerful ways and changed so many lives, and seeing each of my brothers in robes, my fathers, my uncles here, ones who've put up with a very energetic young monk five years ago. I uh, was not always the most restrained of monastics. And, uh, and to see how the Dhamma works in so many people in so many different ways, it's how it, it's like light reflected through a prism. And you just see how it changes people little by little in these completely different ways, dependent on their personalities. You have the shy ones in your midst. You have those who are just a bit more extroverted. I've seen it work in my parents. I've seen it work on so many of the peoples and people around these centers of practice and to come back after five years and see how someone's heart has softened and broadened and brightened, maybe without them even noticing. It just reminds you that you're part of a much deeper storyline and such gratitude to be given a path, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the end, and then to see a few people coming into contact with the Dhamma for the first time. And that's the most pure form of mudita, sympathetic joy, I know. So there's that. And then there's the reflection that for all of its pristine clarity, for all of this uh, elegance and simplicity and focus the Buddha gave us in this teaching. One thing I've seen fall by the wayside for practitioners in it is beauty and joy. And uh, it reminds me, there's a book called Running Towards Mystery about a 10-year-old Brahmin boy, uh, Priyadarshi, his name is. And when he was about eight, he started having visions of this bald man dressed in a bedsheet. And he didn't quite know what that meant uh, until one day he kept just seeing these nimittas, these visions. And one day he just left his boarding school, uh, borrowed a hundred rupees from a friend, boarded a bus and rode it till the end of the line, and then boarded another bus and rode that till the end of the line. And he ended up on Vulture's Peak randomly at a monastery. And in that monastery, there was the picture of a, a Furu Guruji or Guru Furuji, one of those two a really uh, famous monk. And it was the man that he'd seen in these visions. And it's this beautiful story of Kama manifesting these deep roots that have drawn us all. And he dedicates his life to trying to live out the Dhamma for the next 10 years after his parents track him down and bring him home. But uh, it becomes this dry chore for him trying to hold himself and his practice together in the midst of a world which does not seem to want to support him in that. And then one night, he hears these bells and these, this singing from down the road, and he follows it through the lanes of Delhi and comes to this ashram, and he goes in, and there's all these people uh, having this beautiful, joyful Hindu dance and this small, bald... Rishi, or teacher, comes up to him and says, is there so much joy in your religion? Is there so much joy in your religion? And he realizes in that moment that his practice has become dry and empty and grim. And uh, Emerson speaks about the three transcendentals of truth, goodness, and beauty. And I find in this teaching we're given so much truth and so much goodness. But for some of us, there's this quality of beauty and creativity and communion and rejoicing. Longpar Viradamo calls it mudita, his, this sort of act of creation and creativity and rejoicing, mudita, which I think can sometimes be left aside to our detriment. Another senior teacher I know speaks about this book, which points out four archetypes. They're masculine archetypes, but king, warrior, magician, lover. 
And in so many senses, the Theravada is, especially the way it's taught with, with us, it holds so well the characters that lean towards, and the parts of us all that lean towards warrior, you know, sitting more, getting down to the practice. But this archetype of the magician, which loves to play with knowledge, uh, which loves to learn, and this archetype of the lover, which is the creative type, it, its prime directive is to commune with the world. And if it doesn't get to do that by blessing the world and expressing and rejoicing in what wholesome beauty can be found in the world, then the shadow manifests, and the shadow of the lover is the addict. And I think that these are two parts of each of us that are really important to bring out and to speak to in a monastic life, in a monastic environment, and in those realms of lay practice adjacent to this teaching. There's another paradigm, I think, which is important, and that's the two Freudian instincts. Freud talked about eros, the life instinct, which I think is roughly parallel to chanda, zeal, enthusiasm, this desire to make things whole. And uh, I believe this is related to the dopamine system to some extent. And then the other instinct Freud spoke about is thanatos, the death instinct. And this becomes internalized when we're young and socialized as the superego, the part that stops us from doing those things outside of the social bounds. And it's the internal voice that says, stop that, don't do this. And we come and we touch the Dhamma for the first time. And our hearts turn towards it. And often what I've seen in people is we pour our hearts into it, but there's so f- the routes that are easiest and most accessible to us are those of Thanatos, where it's renunciation and eat little, speak little, sleep little, always go back to your kuti and sit in silence until things snap into focus. And those are essential elements of this tradition, the restraint, the structure, the focus on practice and formal practice. And I am by no means devaluing those. They've saved me. But if there's no joy in your religion, then what Longpur Pasanos points to so often, which is that this Pomoja cascade, this well-being cascade, where joy leads to Pomoja, Joy leads to pity, rapture leads to pasadi, tranquility leads to samadhi, leads to wisdom, and so on. This never gets a chance to manifest. Where is the joy in your religion? And to understand that it's important to find ways to bring up and allow this eros to manifest this communion and rejoicing in the world. And not in the world in the sense of a a way of relating to the world and its sense desires that is tied up with the cords of sense desire, but rather a wholesome rejoicing of mudita in some genuinely beautiful qualities of the heart. I think art can be used well in the service of the first and the third noble truths. We can use it to metabolize suffering. There's this union substrate to the heart which speaks in the language of story, embodiment, ritual. And art can settle and transform dukkha. And then there's art in the service of the third noble truth, which is this use of these forms to call forth, to circle around, to rejoice in that which is beautiful, in the sense of spiritual beauty. And this is mudita. And it's... You know, you can, one can sort of hear a young, a young monk talking about this and really think, oh gosh, like, I don't know. But I think it's really significant to point out most of the senior monks often have some way of touching this. Um, Longpur Virdama weaves, Longpur Suchitto uh, draws and writes poetry. Ajahn Amro writes, um, Ajahn Titadamo draws some, and and not to say one gets lost in these things, but just to notice in the heart 
in our hearts, is there a dryness manifesting? Are things becoming completely rote? Is there a lack of any joy? Because faith will carry you often five years in the monastic life. But if after that you've lost touch with beauty and playfulness in a wholesome sense, then the heart has lost one of its deepest and most potent wellsprings. In the suttas, the Buddha in the sutta called the Akupa Sutta, the unshakable, he speaks about a monk who in no who cultivates these qualities will in no long time achieve the unshakable akupa. And then he names Atta Sambhida, discrimination of meanings, of meaning, Atta. Dhamma Sambhida, discrimination of Dhamma. Niruti Sambhida, which is sort of discrimination in terms of language. And then Patibana, Patibana. And this means eloquence, quick wittedness, ready expression. And then he says the fifth quality is uh, one reflects upon the mind as liberated. But this ready expression, uh, the foremost monk in this was Vangisa. He was uh, foremost in Patibana, ready expression. And he would say often to the Buddha, he, uh, blessed one, I sort of basically have something coming up. I would really like to speak this. And the Buddha would say, Patibantu, speak, speak Vangisa. And then he would utter these verses And the canon is full of verse. The devas always speak in verse. And you read the Tergata and the Tirigata, the verses of the elder monks and nuns, and so many of them are these, you know, it's the first body of really impressive nature poetry in the world, I think, in history. It's these aristocratic, formally trained poets from the palace who have gone into nature Uh, and begun to really speak about it. And there's amazing verses by Venerable Mahakasapa and others. So just to say that as we come to this pristine teaching, this crystalline practice, this lineage and form, we're given this trellis and this garden, and it's protected. And then to not neglect, though, to notice... And keep a finger on that pulse in our own hearts, that aspect of ourselves, which is gentle and playful and soft. And to know that within that side of us, there's immense strength. There's a wellspring of goodness, of rejoicing, of Brahma Vihara. And to know that when we enter this form, we give up so many ways of relating to and feeding off of the world that finding other means of rejoicing in goodness, of touching beauty, of channeling eros, of finding chanda, of really honoring these these sides of us, these sides of ourselves, that's important too. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, obviously we have to put aside a great deal of those things. We have to focus on the practice and on what's important. But um, not to forget that beauty and joy can be a part of this path. And I think a very important metric in this life, because we can contort ourselves into very strange creatures in the service of the spiritual path. And uh, a very good metric, I find, is flourishing normalcy and warmth. Flourishing normalcy and warmth. There's these two words we use often in or here often in this uh, lineage, and that's oton, endure, and lui lui. And this is a Thai word that means like, keep going, just keep going. And those are such important words. And I find that if they're used to kind of turn a blind eye to a genuine hunger and dryness in someone's spirit, then they're not being used skillfully. And to also have a, an eye for these uh, gentler, aspects of the heart and these words of flourishing, normalcy, warmth, beauty. So um, it's very meaningful to touch back in to a place like Abayagiri where I do see so much beauty. And these roots have uh, given me so much. The people in this community, the teachers, Longpropasano, um, others have really 
really saved my monastic life to a large extent, and a lot of the elder monks here have guided me and continue to do so. And as we kind of exist up there as these sort of free, free radicals up in Seattle, I'm very grateful to be able to come back and come back into contact with these teachings and this lineage and these uh, monks and elders I owe so much to, and uh, just a real real joy to be back in this environment for a time. So thank you and good luck to everyone.